During this presentation, we will be taking a closer look and focusing on academic integrity. My name is Dr. Kevin Doggerty, and I am one of the Assistant Dean of Students here at UCLA, and I will be walking you through this presentation. At any time during this presentation, if you need to rehear the information, please replay or slide the bar to the area of your choosing. This academic integrity presentation is brought to you by the Office of the Dean of Students. The Dean's Office is located in 1206 Murphy Hall and they are the office that administers the Student Conduct Code. Here at UCLA, students are expected to have behavior that is consistent with the policies set forth in the Student Conduct Code relating to academic and non-academic matters. When students have violated the Student Conduct Code, the Dean's Office addresses these cases with the students. But for more information related to this office, please feel free to visit Murphy Hall and drop by the Dean's Office or utilize their contact information listed on the screen or visit their website. Before we continue, please understand this important note. There will be a quiz at the end of this online academic integrity presentation. You will have only one opportunity to pass this quiz with a 100%. If you receive a score less than 100%, you will be required to attend an in-person academic integrity workshop during the fall quarter in which you will be able to sign up for on the DASHU website. If you receive less than 100% and do not attend this in-person academic integrity workshop, you will not be able to register for your winter quarter courses. For a brief overview, this presentation will cover academic integrity and the expectations that have been set forth by UCLA. Please listen, pay attention to the content, and take notes as there will be a quiz at the end in which you will be required to take. We will discuss the following most common forms of academic dishonesty, which are cheating, unauthorized collaboration, multiple submissions, and plagiarism. We will also discuss the different outcomes or sanctions that students can receive if they are found responsible for academic dishonesty. Importantly, you will be provided with the various resources that are available to you and how you can avoid academic dishonesty. Lastly, as previously stated, there will be a quiz in which you will have to complete. You are probably wondering, why do I have to go through this type of presentation dealing with academic integrity? Well, the answer is simple. UCLA's reputation for academic excellence and institutional integrity is among our most valued assets. As such, academic integrity is of a paramount importance to our institution and it is vital that the institution do all within our power to maintain these standards. Here at UCLA, all students are expected to know and abide by the rules of academic integrity. We recognize that where you come from, the rules may be different from what you have previously learned. Thus, we wanted to provide you with information to help you in your years at UCLA to be successful. Throughout this presentation, you will learn 1. The different forms of academic dishonesty 2. The expectations of academic integrity 3. The outcomes or sanctions of academic dishonesty and 4. Where to get help when needed regarding online and on-campus resources. UCLA is one of the most if not the most applied to universities in the world. What does this mean? This means that everybody wants to come to UCLA to learn. But of course, we cannot accept all students. We accept those students we feel who can handle the academic rigor and will be committed to doing work honestly and with respect. Doing academic work with integrity ensures that all UCLA graduates have learned a certain level of knowledge upon graduation. Yet, if students choose to do work dishonestly, this dishonesty short circuits your learning process while diminishing the reputation of your degree and UCLA. 
therefore, it is imperative that you take your academics seriously as the worth of your degree is dependent upon the people give it. While you are a student, we expect students to embody the values of a true Bruin. During your time here, you will consistently see these true Bruin values throughout the campus and will be expected that all of our students will raise the bar with our values of respect. Students will respect the rights and dignity of others. Accountability. Students will be accountable as an individual and member of this community for their ethical conduct. Integrity. Students will conduct themselves with integrity in their dealings with and on behalf of the university. Service. Students will make an impact in our global community through public service. And excellence. Students will consciously strive for excellence in their work. If you are going through this presentation, this means that you received an offer to attend UCLA, you have accepted that offer, and you will be a student in the upcoming quarter here at UCLA. You should be overly excited with your achievement because all of your hard work, dedication, and scholastic achievements, you have earned the right to be a student at UCLA. But now that you are here, you need to learn a few things to help you remain a student at UCLA regarding academic integrity. Academic integrity at UCLA is not just a priority or an enforcement of faculty and staff. You, the student, is also responsible for maintaining the highest standards of quality, institutional integrity, and freedom of expression. Academic integrity is our most precious resource, a resource that has built a solid and highly reputable reputation. Therefore, if we lose our academic integrity, we lose the four letters of UCLA. For the next part of this presentation, we will begin to discuss the common academic dishonesty violations here at UCLA. We will discuss these common violations in depth and provide scenarios for you to think about. Now, the scenarios that are provided are real situations that have occurred here at UCLA. But of course, we have changed the names of these students. So let's begin with cheating. Cheating includes, but is not limited to, the use of unauthorized materials or study aids in any academic exercise which gives an unfair advantage to the student. Cheating also includes the alteration of any answers in a graded document before submitting it for regrading. Furthermore, cheating can be the failure to observe the express procedures or instructions of an academic exercise. Now you're probably wondering or thinking that this information may seem very simplistic or even elementary but yet students tend to find themselves in these types of situations. So let's take a look at scenario one on the next slide, for example. James and Mark are both electrical engineer majors, juniors at UCLA, and have been best friends since their senior year of high school. Mark recently has been feeling homesick and was not prepared for his midterm exam in engineering 599 course on Wednesday, July 18th, 2012. During the exam, Mark was seated next to James and was copying off of James's exam. James recognized that Mark was copying and continued to allow Mark to copy. Now ask yourself, what do you see wrong in this scenario? Now after reading scenario one, you should have recognized a few issues which will be discussed further in depth on this slide. But if you didn't see those issues, please replay that scenario and see if you can find what those issues were. But there are a few common pitfalls that students tend to find themselves in when it comes to this type of scenario. One, we recommend to any and all students that if you have a friend or have studied with the classmate for an exam, during that exam, do not sit next to that person. By not sitting next to each other, you eliminate the suspicion of cheating if your exams happen to look like the same or has the same mistakes. 
Two, you are to never copy off another student's exam, no matter what. You do not know if the student you are copying from is providing correct information on their exam or if you have the same version of the exam. You should always trust your information and provide your own information on your exam. Three, you are to never allow someone to copy off of your exam. Allowing someone to copy off of your exam is considered a violation of the Student Conduct Code, which is facilitating academic dishonesty. Four, you should always communicate with your professor when things are going good and when things are going bad. Explaining to your professor that you are not prepared for the exam or inquiring if you can take the exam at a later date is better than committing academic dishonesty. Now, although it is up to your professor to grant that request, this is better than resorting to cheating. Collaborating during an exam, as James and Mark demonstrated, without permission is a violation and leads us to our next topic. Throughout your various classes at UCLA, you will be encouraged to collaborate, work in groups, or submit group projects. Yet, students often find themselves in difficult situations when collaborating on assignments when they are not supposed to. Unauthorized collaboration is working on an assignment with another person without receiving the professor or instructor's approval. We have experienced situations where students fail to follow the instructions with a professor expressed that students must do individual work or situations where the students believe that because they are working together on a project or paper, they should submit the same work to the professor. Unless stated otherwise, you are to submit your own original work. Let's look a little deeper into this topic with the scenario on the next slide. Sylvia and Kim are lab partners in their statistics lab course. The students are allowed to conduct their experiments together, which will produce the same data. Their professor explained that their lab reports are to be written individually. Sylvia and Kim decided to collaborate while writing their reports as they figured since the data would be the same, the report would be the same too. Now, is there anything wrong in this scenario? Now sometimes it is easy to have a misunderstanding when it comes to unauthorized collaborations. But that is why we are here today. Because you have to know where and when to draw the line. Or in other words, you have to understand when group work stops and where individual work begins. We tend to see a lot of these unauthorized collaborations in situations of lab reports. Although you and your lab partner may have the same data as you were conducting the experiment together, your content will be different as each person writes differently. During group work, Everyone is responsible for contributing to the project or to the answers for those certain questions. But however, dividing up the work and then swapping is considered a violation as some students would get credit for work that they did not do. So please know and understand that your professors may assign you to a lab partner, but yet you will be expected to do individual work. Now if you are unclear about the instructions and assignments, please communicate with your professor to seek clarification. Seeking clarification in any situation from your professor will greatly benefit you, especially in the next topic of multiple submissions. Utilizing knowledge or information that you have acquired or learned will always be promoted and acknowledged in your classes. But however, Students try to use previous assignments such as papers or lab reports that they have submitted for a grade in one course and then use that same paper or lab report for another course to fulfill certain requirements. Here at UCLA, that is against the Student Conduct Code and it is called multiple submissions. Let's look at scenario three pertaining to this issue. 
Cedric is a senior and has to write a paper on the topic of reflecting on my college experience for his senior seminar course. Cedric remembered that he wrote a paper during his freshman year in an English class on the topic of my freshman year experience. Cedric decided to use part of his paper from the English class to complete his paper for the senior seminar course. Now, did Cedric actually commit academic dishonesty? Now while here at UCLA, it is possible that you will come across classes where your professor is requiring you to write a paper that just so happens to cover the same information that you have previously written about in another paper for another class. In these situations, students believe that it is okay to submit their previous paper because it is their paper and not somebody else's. Now as you read on the previous slide about multiple submissions, you have to get permission from your professor before using a previous paper. Now it is up to your professor to give you permission or not. If you have received permission to use a previous paper, please clarify what you intend to do with your paper. If you plan to use some of your paper or all, express that to your professor. Typically though, your professor will want you to build on the previous work by quoting, summarizing, paraphrasing, and citing yourself to prevent plagiarism as opposed to just copying your own work. Be clear, be upfront, be transparent with your professor about your intentions with your paper as this will be in your best interest. Now brace yourself for this next topic as plagiarism is our most common form of academic dishonesty. One of the common myths with plagiarism is that students think that plagiarism only relates to using someone else's words. But plagiarism is much more than just using someone else's words as it also includes using someone's ideas, designs, or even data. It is possible that your previous school may not have taught you how to avoid plagiarism and that you may not have any intentions to plagiarize in your papers. Yet, even the lack of knowledge of citing, providing wrong or improper citations is considered plagiarism. Let's take a look at scenario number four. Now Jackie and Jill are roommates and best friends from high school. They are both taking the same English course at UCLA. The last paper is due tomorrow morning and Jackie has finished her paper and is getting ready for bed. But Jill is still working on her paper but struggles to make everything flow. She asks Jackie for her paper to make sure she understands the concepts. Jackie gives it to her and is off to bed. Jill uses Jackie's paper to better structure her language, format, and arguments. Now think carefully. Is there anything wrong in this scenario? Now after reading scenario 4, it is possible that you didn't see anything wrong with Jill's action. It's okay. But let's discuss the problems with plagiarism a little bit deeper. Numerously, we see students who choose to copy and paste information from the internet, an article, or a book into their papers and then submit that information to their professors. Copying and pasting information from any source is a common mistake and easily identifiable by your professors. We also tend to see students who do not paraphrase, quote, summarize, or even cite their work. Your professors will expect to see and read your thoughts, your ideas. They want to see the parenthetical citations, not just the words from other authors or other researchers. A lot of students we have encountered have a tendency to use a friend's or a classmate's paper as a guide for their own paper. Yet, what usually happens is that the papers begin to sound exactly the same or very similar 
which is why we recommend that students do not give their papers to other students. Although it is a small number of students, we have experienced students purchasing papers from various websites or paying someone to write their papers for them. As this may seem simple or obvious, students are expected to write their own paper and not rely on a writing service or another person to complete their papers. Lastly, it is imperative that you follow the instructions regarding your paper assignments as some professors will explain that you are not allowed to use outside resources or that using Wikipedia is prohibited. These issues with plagiarism usually come in two different forms, intentional and unintentional, which is discussed next. Now, students who commit an act of plagiarism usually falls into two categories, unintentional and intentional plagiarism. When discussing unintentional plagiarism, this is where we tend to see students who happen to have a lack of skills, awareness, or may have developed bad habits in their writings. On the other hand, intentional plagiarism is when we see students that are copying and pasting information from a source, not citing appropriately, or turning in their friend's papers as their own. But regardless of the intentional or unintentional plagiarism, it is still considered a violation of the UCLA Student Conduct Code. Now research has shown that different countries have different viewpoints or standards when it comes to plagiarism. But yet, here in Western civilization, it is imperative that you understand the expectations that have been set forth. So if you are writing a paper that requires you to use outside resources, your professors will expect that you are quoting, summarizing, and paraphrasing while adding your own thoughts to the subject matter. Now when you are quoting, you are using the author's exact words in your paper. In addition, you are providing the quote symbols. So as you look on the screen, under the quoting heading, you will see red quotation marks. These quotation marks signify that this sentence is the author's exact words. In regards to summarizing, you are shortening the text and discussing the author's main points. In paraphrasing, you are restating in your own words the author's words or ideas. But yet, you are touching on all of the author's points. Regardless of whether you are quoting, summarizing or paraphrasing, a parenthetical or in-text citation is required. So if you look at each sentence under each heading, you will notice the purple font color which signifies that parenthetical citation. Providing the in-text citation lets your professor know where you have received your information. Without providing this information or failing to provide quotation marks for a quote, this will be considered plagiarism. Your professors will use various resources to check your paper for plagiarism, such as Turnitin.com. And the majority of your professors will use a resource called Turnitin.com. Now, this is a website that professors will use to check their students' papers for potential plagiarism. This website is a match-finding website that scans your paper against the internet, publications, and student papers to see if there is a match. If there is a match, the system will highlight the areas where there are matches. So for example, if you see where the blue arrows are pointing, this is showing you just a few areas of this paper signifying the highlighted areas. But wherever there is a highlighted sentence, this means that there is a match. And from this example that you see, almost all of the sentences are highlighted. 
Although a highlighted sentence does not mean there is plagiarism, it just means that there are matches in which your professor would look further into to see if there are plagiarized sentences or paragraphs. Now at the end of this scanning of your paper, the system generates an originality report of your paper, which you will see on the next slide. This originality report that you see here is provided to your professor, not to the student. This report shows how much of your paper is a match to the internet, publications, student papers, and provides an overall similarity percentage that you see shaded in blue with an arrow pointed to it. The report also provides a list of the sources where the highlighted matches throughout your paper came from. These resources are listed in numerical order and listed under the primary sources on the report. Numerous students consistently ask if there is a certain threshold or percentage that is acceptable for Turnitin.com at UCLA. I assure you that if we knew what that percentage was, we would tell you. But unfortunately, there is not a certain threshold. Some of your professors may feel that a 20% overall similarity index is acceptable, while others may not. The Dean's Office has seen cases as low as 5% and as high as 99% as a similarity index. To make sure your paper does not reach a high percentage, be sure you are citing your papers appropriately, that you are providing your own words, that you are paraphrasing summarizing and quoting where necessary. Now these are just some of the things you can do to be successful with your academic work. But on the next slide and for the remainder of this presentation you will learn other things you can do to be successful as well as learn what happens if you are found responsible for academic dishonesty. Here are some other things you can do to be successful while you are here at UCLA. 1. Rely on your own notes. Now in order for you to rely on your notes, that means you have to go to class every day. But of course, situations do occur where you may not be able to make it to class. But instead of copying notes from a friend or a classmate, have that person discuss with you the points that were discussed in class and take notes from that discussion. Usually, Students copy notes from their classmates and by doing this you are assuming that what they have written in their notes is coherent, comprehensive, that it makes sense, and that they were paying attention in class. If they were paying attention, they should be able to discuss with you verbally the information that they learned in class. Or you can follow up with the professor regarding the information you missed. Visit your professors and ask them questions about the course content. 2. Here at UCLA, you will probably write two types of papers, reflection or research papers. If you are writing a reflection paper, you are providing your thoughts on that particular topic, and usually a reflection paper does not require you providing research. Now, when you are writing a research paper, in addition to you providing your thoughts on that particular topic, you are also providing research from authors that support the information you are discussing. Thus, as we have learned previously, you are quoting, summarizing, paraphrasing, and citing this information for your paper. 3. In your study groups or when you are collaborating with your classmates, only discuss the main points when possible. Instead of trying to write down everything that everybody is saying, focus on the main points. With this approach, you will not have to worry about your professors wondering why a group of people are providing exactly the same information, word for word, on a short answer or essay question. During your exams or quizzes, do not sit next to a person that you have studied with. Sit away, and I mean far away from each other. It is possible that the information you studied or wrote down on your study guide may be incorrect. Thus, if you are sitting next to the person that you studied with and are providing the same exact wrong information, 
This will raise a concern or suspicion with your professor by giving them the assumption that the two or even three of you were copying off of each other's exam. And number five, during your time here, you will probably have a take home exam for one of your classes. If so, please be sure to follow the instructions thoroughly. If your professor instructs you to not speak to anyone during the time when the take home exams have been administered or passed out, you are not allowed to speak to anyone about the exam. This can include classmates, friends, family, or even tutors. If your professor says you are only allowed to look at your notes and books for the exam, that means you cannot browse the internet. Please adhere to the instructions thoroughly as a lot of our students are found responsible for academic dishonesty due to their failure to follow the instructions. Through the Dean's Office experiences, we tend to receive numerous questions from students regarding academic dishonesty. So we felt that it would be beneficial to you to answer some of these questions ahead of time. Question one. Can I get in trouble for giving my paper to another student? The answer is yes, you can. If your professor instructed you to not collaborate with anyone while working on your paper, this would be considered a violation of our student conduct code. Also, you should never just give your paper to another student as you do not know what that other person will do with your paper. They could copy your paper word for word or maybe just even sections of your paper or they could just submit your paper as their own. Instead of giving your paper to that other person, have a discussion about the topic of your paper with the student who is in need of help. Question two, what if my paper looks like my friends because we attend the same tutoring sessions or study groups? Well, this is not possible. The reason why this is not possible is because no two people write exactly the same. We all come from different places, different walks of life. We think differently. We act differently. And therefore, we will write differently. While we recommend that you and your friend or classmate write on different topics, we recognize that you and your friend may be writing on the same topic, which is fine. But regardless, your paper should not have the same flow of information. Also, as we discussed earlier, while in your study groups or discussing a particular paper, you should only focus on the main points and not write everything word for word. Question three, what if I made a mistake? Now we are humans, so that means mistakes do happen and we must learn from those mistakes. But if it is determined that what occurred in your paper was a mistake, that will be taken into consideration. Now, of course, there is a big matter of fact, there is a huge difference between forgetting to provide quotation marks, for example, around a quote, as opposed to going to the wrong website to purchase your paper. As one is definitely a mistake and the other is not. Question four. Won't you just take the word of the TA or the faculty member since I am a student? The answer is absolutely false. We do not solely rely on what the faculty member or the TA has to say or what information they have provided to our office. We need to hear from you. We need to hear from the students. We need to be able to hear all sides of the story and thus the student side of the story is just as important. Question five. Will I fail the course if I am found responsible for academic dishonesty? Well, it depends. That may not be the answer you want to hear, but it's the truth. When students are found responsible for academic dishonesty, the professor has the authority to give a zero on the assignment in which the student committed academic dishonesty. For example, if you are found responsible for cheating on an exam that is worth 50% of your final grade and your professor decides to give you a zero, it is possible that you will fail the course. Question six, 
What happens to my grade if I am not found responsible for academic dishonesty? If you are not found responsible for academic dishonesty, you are supposed to get the grade that you earned for that course. Now, if you feel you did not get the grade that you earned, even though you were found not responsible for academic dishonesty, please get in contact with the dean's office and we will walk you through the steps you will need to take. And question seven, what does DR mean and how does it affect me? When students are accused of academic dishonesty, your professors will give a temporary grade of DR, which means deferred report. Students will see this DR reflected on their transcripts. This DR will remain until the matter has been completely resolved by the Dean's Office. Once this has been resolved, the student will receive the grade that they earn for that course. And just for your knowledge, a student cannot graduate from UCLA with a DR on their transcripts. You have learned a lot of information thus far in this presentation and we hope that you have paid attention. Now, this next information that we are about to share is very important and can impact you very greatly. Here are a list of things that can happen if you are found responsible for academic dishonesty. As you see the first one written in red font, that if you are found responsible for academic dishonesty, you will receive some form of a suspension or a dismissal from UCLA. This means that you cannot attend classes at UCLA. You are probably thinking that this is a severe outcome. But as you learned earlier, UCLA takes academic dishonesty seriously and we are providing you with this information in the beginning for your awareness as this sanction outcome can be very severe for you. Number two, for the international students, if you are suspended or dismissed, that means you will lose your student visa as you are no longer a student. Thus, you would be required to return to your home country within 15 days. Number three, if you are suspended, this could even delay your graduation as you are temporarily removed from attending classes for one or maybe even more quarters. Number four, the assignment that was in question may receive a grade penalty if you are found responsible for academic dishonesty. This grade could impact your final grade for that particular course. Number five, if you are suspended, this could impact your finances. You may have to pay for extra quarters because of your suspension. Some of your scholarships may have a provision or a clause that says you must remain in good academic standing in order to receive or keep your scholarships. Number six, if you are suspended or dismissed, this will be notated on your transcripts. Your transcripts will state that you are on suspension during the time that you have been suspended from UCLA. Number seven, in the Dean's Office, we provide Dean certification to the students who are applying for graduate schools, medical schools, law schools, or even seeking employment. If you are required to provide a Dean certification or information to that particular school or employer that speaks to your conduct history, we provide notification of these cases where students have received a suspension or higher from our office. We will explain or provide what the violation was, when the violation occurred, and what the outcome was. Lastly, think about the reputational harm that can be inflicted upon your family, your friends, the community, UCLA, those committed to your success, but more importantly, you. As a student here at UCLA, there are numerous resources that you can utilize as well as online resources. Here you will find a list of these resources that are available to you. Please take a moment to write down this information in which you can have at your disposal. 
Here are more resources that you can use. We want to be able to provide you with as many resources as possible to help you be successful. So please take one more moment to write down this information. Here in the Dean's Office, we like to come up with different acronyms to help in our delivery of information. So here is one that we came up with to help students with their writing. And it is follow the code. The C in code is for cite. No matter what, you must cite any words, thoughts, ideas, pictures that are not your own. The O in code is for original. In addition to citing information that is not your own, you should also include your own ideas in your papers. Your professors want to hear your thoughts too. The D in code is for do. Always do the necessary research for your papers and make sure that you do follow the assignment instructions. And the E in code is for evaluation. Always evaluate what you have written before you submit it. Make sure that the work you are submitting is to the best of your ability. Now, as it was mentioned earlier, you have earned the right to be a Bruin here at UCLA. But now it is your responsibility to remain here. We hope that you have taken this information seriously and will utilize the resources that were provided to you. You have reached the conclusion of this academic integrity presentation. At this time, please go to the Dash U Center website to take your mandatory quiz. As a reminder, you only have one opportunity to take this quiz and receive a score of 100%. If you receive anything less than that 100%, you will be required to attend an in-person academic integrity workshop during the fall quarter. Please remember that if you do not attend this workshop, you will not be able to register for your winter quarter courses. Good luck and welcome again to UCLA.